from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everybody. I'm Josephine Reed. I work at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm here to introduce Kevin Young. And let me begin by giving you the skinny on Kevin Young. He's an award-winning poet who's a professor of creative writing and English at Emory University, where he's also the curator of the Raymond Donowski Poetry Library. His collection of essays, The Gray Album, On the Blackness of Blackness, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Kevin Young has written eight volumes of poetry and edited eight collections. His poetry and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Callaloo, and many other journals. He casts a wide net, ranging in topics from Jean-Michel Basquiat to the food that binds him to his Louisiana heritage to the Amistad Rebellion. But all this doesn't tell you what it's like to read Kevin Young's poetry. He isn't a musician in the traditional sense of the word, but boy, does he make music with his words, taking vernacular and musical idioms to their poetic limits. In Ardency, a chronicle of the Amistad rebels, for example, Young crafted an American epic that captures the horror of slavery while marking the strength of those who fought and survived it. Yet while Ardency's poems capture the brutality of the slave trade, they're also identifying the origin of the blues that informs Young's work. We see these blues in Kevin's latest collection of poetry, Book of Hours. Book of Hours deals with grief, mind-numbing grief, and its slow, slow transition to joy. It centered on aspects of fatherhood, from the sudden loss of his own father to the birth and infancy of his child. Young writes, the grammar of grief gets written every day, and Book of Hours begins with profound grief and the mechanical tasks involved when coping with the death of a parent. Writing a eulogy, making funeral arrangements, picking up dry cleaning, giving away old suits. Then he pauses to ask, how can I give away the last of your scent? Yet he does, and following his father's wishes, gives away much, much more. Poignantly, Young studies the bereavement of his father's dogs, envying what he terms their colossal and forgetful grief. Their inability to grasp perpetuity and, in, and the inevitability of death, which for Kevin is all too apparent and leaves him gasping at its enormity. With language that seems to hover between a prayer and a song, he constructs a day book of grief that moves slowly, painfully, into a knowing joy with the birth of his son. He endures sorrow and comes out the other side, and that's due in no small part to poetry and its ability to bring us out of darkness. Most of these poems are only a page or two, and a few are much shorter, but together they create a narrative infused with the rhythms of death, birth, of life. Music is in the poems themselves, which hover between the psalms and the blues, giving shape to sorrow, to the passage of time, to letting go, and to resilience. The medieval book of hours is a devotional book, a, a liturgical day book, if you will. Because it's an illuminated manuscript, though, each book of hours is unique, even if they contain similar collections of prayers and psalms. Kevin Young's Book of Hours also combines the particular and the universal. He minds his grief, observes his transition from that place, and then shares his joy, linking them in an ongoing journey composed with urgency and contemplation as the days add up with their dozens of daily tasks. And by doing this with such acuity, he offers us the language, the music, so many can find when confronted with our own inevitable losses. Young ends his book with a challenge to the reader, or perhaps more accurately, an affirmation, with the words, why not sing? Why not indeed? With poets like Kevin Young and collections like Book of Hours that recognize grief in all its permutations, celebrates resilience, and demonstrates poetry's ability to illuminate the darkest and most profound aspects of our lives. Here's Kevin Young. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for coming out, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Um, it's lovely to be here. Back at the Book Festival, um, we were remembering that I was here, I think, seven years ago, um, so it's a real treat to return. Um, I thought I'd actually start with some blues, some older poems, from really uh, a book that came out around that time called Dear Darkness. It's a book of blues and uh, elegy in many ways, um, but also of odes. And so I thought I'd read this blues, because it mentions Labor Day. It's called Limelight Blues. Limelight Blues. I have been known to wear white shoes beyond Labor Day. I can see through doors and walls made of glass. I'm in an anger encouragement class. When I walk over the water of parking lots, car doors lock. When I wander or enter the elevator, women snap their pocketbooks shut, clutch their handbags close. Plain clothes, cops follow me in stores, asking me to holler if I need any help. I can get a rise. I'm able to cause patrolmen to stop and second look. Any drugs in the trunk? Civilian teens beg me for green. Where to score around here? When I dance, which is often, the moon above me wheels its disco lights until there's a fight. Crowds gather and wonder how the spotlight sounds, like a body being born, like the blare of car horns as I cross the street, unlooking, slow. I know all a movie needs is me, shouting at the screen from the balcony. From such heights, I watch the darkness gather. What pressure my blood is under. Thank you. So uh, I, around that time, I started writing these odes to everyday things. Um, Pablo Neruda has his lovely elemental odes. And in some way, I was thinking of them. But I was also thinking of my father. Um, and the food I grew up eating, uh, we're, both my parents are from Louisiana, and we had okra, I'd say, every night, sometimes for breakfast. And, um, you know, my f father used to always say, uh, you know, I guess people call it soul food. My father would always say, well, we just called it food when we were young. So I'll read a couple odes. This is Ode to Chicken. You are everything to me. Frog legs, rattlesnake, almost anything I put my mouth to reminds me of you. <laughs> Folks always try getting you to act like you someone else. Nuggets or tenders, fingers you don't have. But even your unmanicured feet taste sweet. Too loud in the yard, segregated dark and light. You are like a day, self-contained. Your sunset skin puckers like a kiss. Let others put on airs, pigs graduate to pork, bread become toast, even beef was once just bull before it got them degrees. But even dead, you keep your name and head. You can make anything of yourself, you know, but prefer to wake me early in the cold. Fix me breakfast and dinner too. Leave me to fly for you. Thanks. So I'll read this poem, which is um, from the end of the book. Uh, and I started writing these odes. Uh, there's an ode to greens. There's an ode to kitchen grease. Um, because uh, I was really, you know, he had just died, and I couldn't write for a time. And then I started writing them, and I realized uh, in writing about this food of our childhood or my childhood and our shared uh, past, it was a way of, you know, wanting him, getting him back, make, bringing him close. And I, food, I think, does that, uh, and so does poetry. It can bring us back instantly with all our senses to a time and a place. So this poem is an ode to Boudin. 
You might know uh, that boudin is like a sausage. It's sort of the national food of southern Louisiana. It's almost like fast food there. Every sort of corner store has their own. It's quite perfect as a food. It's sausage casing, rice, meat, spices. Um, and uh, if you haven't had the pleasure, I suggest you sample. Ode to Boudin. You are the chewing gum of God. You are the reason I know that skin is only that, holds more than it meets. The heart of you is something I don't quite get, but don't want to. Even a fool like me can see your broken beauty, the way out in this world where most things disappear, driven into ground. You are ground already, and like rice, you rise. Drunken deacon, sausages half-brother, jambalaya's baby mama, you bring me back to the beginning, to where things live again. Homemade savior, you fed me the day my father sat under flowers, white as the gloves of pallbearers thrown on his beer. Soon, hands will lower him into ground richer than even you. For now, root of all remembrance, your thick chain sets me spinning, thinking of how, like the small, perfect, possible, silent soul, you spill out like music, my daddy dead, or grief, or both. Afterward, his sisters, my aunts, dancing in the yard to a car radio tuned to Zydeco beneath the pecan trees. So um, my most recent book is called Book of Hours, and um, it came out uh, last year and was 10 years after he had died. And it, I wanted to sort of return to that moment uh, and explore it, sort of feel again and describe again, I suppose, what it was like, what the hours and minutes and days after his passing uh, felt like. So this poem is called Bereavement. Bereavement. Behind his house, my father's dogs sleep in kennels, beautiful. He built just for them. They do not bark. Do they know he is dead? They wag their tails and head. They beg and are fed. Their grief is colossal and forgetful. Each day they wake, seeking his voice, their names. By dusk, they seem to unremember everything. To them, even hunger is a game. For that I envy, for that I cannot bear to watch them pacing their cage. I try to remember they love best confined space to feel safe. Each day a saint comes by to feed the pair and I draw closer the shades. I've begun to think of them as my father's other sons, as kin, brothers in paw. My eyes each day thaw. One day the water cuts off, then back on. They are outside dogs, which is to say healthy and victorious, purposeful, and one giant muscle like the heart. Dad taught them not to bark, to point out their prey, to stay. Were they there that day? They call me like witnesses and will not say. I ask for their care and their carelessness, wish of them forgiveness. I must give them away. I must find for them homes, sleep restless in his all night. I expect they pace as I do. Each dog like an eye, roaming with the dead beneath an unlocked lid.
Um, my father died in Kansas, uh, and I was in Boston and Indiana at the time. So there was a lot of flying back and forth. Uh, and so this poem's about the airport, which is such a strange place anyway. But there you are flying and, and, and thinking of this person who has, in effect, flown away from you. Uh, so this poem's called Mercy. Mercy. On line for the plane, a woman carried her heart on her lap. And I thought, could it be yours she held tight? It wasn't her heart yet, of course, was her future heart, I guess. Soon, inside her beating, after being dead on the table a minute or two during surgery in a hospital called Mercy. For now, wheeled alongside her, her almost heart sat labeled and tucked in its red chest of ice. I thought I could be her holding you hoping there was enough life left in you to help me again breathe. I knew full well you were not there, Father, that it was your liver lifted out of you and set like a bloody stone inside somebody else to save. After being checked for danger, just beyond the glass doors, I watched a farmer father and mother send off their plaid son the first time he'd flown, everyone wiping their eyes and waving. So, um... When someone passes away or dies that you love, you sometimes have to talk to people who are supposed to help you, like on the phone. Um, these people are horrible, so I wrote a poem about them. <laughs> it's called Codicil, which, as you'll recall, is uh, sort of an, an addition to a will. Codicil. May God or whoever else, spare you the arms of bereavement specialists. Grant mercy from the team dedicated to your transition in this difficult time, yet who won't tell you a thing and know far less. Those innocent, interminable, polite, unreachable voices over the phone, do not suffer those. They are unlike death, who does not ask or give one wit for your death certificate. They need duplicates of. No originals. No, now three letters of testamentary, six pounds of flesh, whatever is left. Hell is not a live voice. Just listen to our complete menu as our options have changed. Press one for purgatory, two for shame, three to get ready, four for blame. Five years of phone calls to sort your death out. And one day, the avenging angel of telemarketing leaves a message not asking after you, but acting as if you and she had spoken today. Paul just wanted to get back to you about the cruise. My response was what the afterlife must be like, quick, mean, a piece of my mind, and passing along, no peace, just righteousness. If ever she called back, I said, I'd kill her, and not with kindness, as does the phone. Better to go it alone. So the middle part of the book uh, has a slightly different tone, and I thought I'd read you a few of those poems. This poem is called Expecting. Expecting. Grave, my wife lies back, hands cross her chest, while the doctor searches early for your heartbeat, peach pit, unripe plum, pulls out the world's worst boombox, a Mr. Microphone, to broadcast your mother's lifting belly. The whoosh and bellows of mama's body, and beneath it, nothing. Beneath the slow stutter of her heart, nothing. The doctor trying again to find you, fragile fern, snowflake, nothing. After 
my wife will say, in fear, impatient, she went beyond her body, this tiny room, into the ether. For now, we spelunk for you one last time, lost canary, miner of coal and chalk, lungs not yet black. I hold my wife's feet to keep her here and me, trying not to dive starboard to seek you in the dark water. And there it is, faint, an echo faster and further away than mothers, all beatbox and fuzzy feedback. You were like hearing hip hop for the first time, power hijacked from a lamppost, all promise. You couldn't sound better, break dancer, my favorite song bumping from a passing car. You snuck into the club underage and stayed. Only later, much, will your mother begin to believe your drumming in the distance, our Kansas City and Congo Square, this jazz band vamping on inside her. So I thought I'd read this poem, uh, which is called Crowning. It's about the birth of my son. Um, my wife, who's here, is the hero of this poem. You should give her a round of applause. <laughs> um, especially because he was 9 pounds, 13 ounces. His birthday's tomorrow, so he, he gets an applause, too. Crowning. Now that knowing means nothing. Now that you are more born than being, more awake than awaited, since I've seen your hair deep inside mother, a glimpse, grass in late winter, early spring, watching your mother's pursed, throbbing, purpled power, her pushing you for one whole hour, two, almost three, almost out, maybe never. Animal smell and peat, breath and sweat and mulch matter. And at once you descend or drive, are driven by mother's body, by her will and brilliance, by bowel, by wanting, and your hair peering as if it could see. And I saw you storming forth, taproot, your cap of hair half in, half out, and wait, hold it there, the doctors say. And she squeezing my hand, her face full of fire, then groaning your face out like a flower, blood bloom crocused into air, shoulders, and the long cord still rooting you to each other, to the other world, into this afterlife, amongst us living. The cord I cut like an iris, pulsing. Then you wet against mother's chest, still purple, not blue, not yet red, no cry, warming now, now opening your eyes, midnight blue in the blue-black dawn. Thank you. So the rest of that uh, book really talks about the afterlife, that afterlife I mentioned, the afterlife of grief, uh, which I suppose uh, in some ways is life, um, and, and dealing with uh, this wondrous thing, the birth of a child, um, but also uh, not so long after the death of my father. Before I um, sort of end with some of those poems, I thought I'd read you some newer poems. Um, they're sort of new to you. Um, uh, I have a book coming out in February called Blue Laws, uh, and it's 20 years of work. It's a selected and uncollected poems, I call it. So there's a lot of sort of bonus tracks and outtakes. Um, so I thought rather than read some older poems, I'd read some of the bonus tracks. Some of them happen to be a little older. So these are outtakes from a book called Jelly Roll, a blues, which was a book of uh, blues-based love poems. Uh, I keep trying to get away from the blues and it just, you know, they bring me back in. Um, so uh, this, uh, these are sort of the love poems uh, of various kinds and I'll just read a few. 
This one's called Hurricane Song. Hurricane Song. Lady, won't you wait out the hurricane all night at my place? We'll take cover like the lamps, and I'll let you oil my scalp. Please. I need a good woman's hands caught in my hair, turning my knots to butter. All night we'll churn. Dawn will lean in too soon. You'll leave out into the wet world, winded and alone, knowing the me only midnight sees. And this one's called Strays. Strays. The moon of you I want to meet, far away, waning. Asleep in the sun of your arms, then cold when you're gone. In the dark where we can no longer see, I want your hands blurry over me, reading the braille of my body. Your narcotic touch, your such and such, makes me rush home through dark, slick streets and hush to our bright, too hot house. Only you sleep somewhere else. I miss you like a monument misses its dead. The stone heads staring, the hands stiff or still, half eroded by time. Tell me, and I'll write what you want near my name. And I'll read um, about some more recent uh, outtakes. Everyone doing all right all there? Um, one ends up writing sort of, uh, I guess what, bless you, uh, occasional poems. Poems of uh, place, but also of time, you know? And that's sort of the things that you can't always capture in a book, at least I can't. Um, so it was a pleasure to go through for Blue Laws and kind of look at some of those poems. Uh, so this is uh, one of them. It's called Rapture. Rapture. I want to be awake when the world ends. I want to be my friend who rose to an empty house, even his grandmother and her worn cross gone, and thought it was the rapture that he hadn't crossed over. Let me rip my shirt as he did and tear into the street, hollering. Let me hear only my blood this morning in the rain before the dawn. No one on the line. Later, when they return, let those I love who left have only gone to the store, running errands, this errant, unebbing life. After, let what I've torn the myself I mourn, be mended and start over like a scar or star. So I'll just end with a few from uh, the end of Book of Hours. This poem is called Memorial Day. It's, uh, since we had a little Labor Day, let's get some Memorial Day in there. Um, uh, and it's about exercising after a certain age in one's life. <laughs> the pleasure is but mostly the pain of that. It's called Memorial Day. I wake early to join the others dying of sweat or breath, trying to return to the bodies we once owed, owned, slow going on a quick track. We orbit the fake grass, sun already high enough to burn the eyes or arms, windmilling for all it's worth. We keep finding ourselves in each other's way, silent we spin, a cavalcade of future pain. And then, in the blue beside the ring, up springs a proper parade. 
traffic lined up, and ashen veterans, three left, bow their heads while names are read. Is that a prayer I can't make out above the quick trinity of rifle fire, smoke clouding the air? None flinch. We keep pace along with our shortening shadows, every ache a wish. And this last poem is called The Mission. It's about the Mission District in uh, San Francisco, where I used to live. And um, it also uh, mentions Emily Dickinson. And I always feel I have to clarify that I know that she never lived in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> someone asked me after a reading. It wasn't really a question. It was more like, you know she didn't live there, right? Um, so thank you so much for coming out. and. Uh, listening and we'll have a little Q&A after this. The mission. Back there then I lived across the street from a home for funerals. Afternoons I'd look out the shades and think of the graveyard behind Emily Dickinson's house. How death was no concept but soul after soul she watched pour into the cold New England ground. Maybe it was the son of the mission, maybe just being more young, but it was less disquiet than comfort. Days, the street filled with cars for a wake. Children played tag out front while the bodies snuck in the back. The only hint of death, those clusters of cars. Lights low as talk, idling dark as the second-hand suits that fathers or sons, now orphans, had rescued out of closets, praying they still fit. Most did. Most laughed despite themselves, shook hands, and grew hungry out of habit, evening coming on again. The home's clock broke like a bone, always read three. Mornings or dead of night, I wondered who slept there and wrote letters I later forgot I sent my father. Now find buoyed up among the untidy tide of his belongings. He kept everything but alive. I have come to know sorrows not noun but verb something that, unlike living by doing right, you do less of. The sun is too bright. Your eyes adjust, become like the night. Hands covering the face, its numbers dark and unmoving, unlike the cars that fill and start to edge out quiet cortege crawling half dim till I could not see to see. Thank you. Thanks. 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 So, are there any questions? Yes. I think there's microphones you might want to or I can repeat your question, whatever. Um, which comes first, the poem or the title? Which comes first, the poem or the title is the question. Um, it's a little of both. Uh, I hate to split it down the middle, but um, for me, often a title, you almost kind of trick yourself with a title, or the title spins off the poem. Um, I'm trying to think of examples, and none come to mind. Um, but say that poem, Crowning, you know, it's hard to say which came first. First came the life, you know. And then, you know, to try to describe uh, a, such a transformative experience as birth um, without being corny. You know, I love the language of uh, pregnancy and birthing, uh, you know, uh, that it feels like you enter this world, at least for me as a, a guy who wasn't aware of a, a, some of that, um, that has its own language. I mean, and it's also a body language. And I guess a poem is almost like that. It's, it's sort of language in some sense, but also body language. And that kind of transformation 
can happen in the title, but sometimes, you know, I think like that poem Hurricane Song, it probably had a bunch of titles searching for one. So um, you're lucky if it all comes at once, but often it's a process that comes later. Yes. Hi, Kevin. I'm Cynthia, CC Fellow. Hi, good to see Hi. you. Two questions. Number one, how does your family feel about being in your poems? How's my family feel? Yeah. They, ha they have no choice. They so. have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And number two, how does a poem become an out outtake or a B track? You, know, you decide or <laughs> yeah. your editor decides sure. or it's intuitive. Thanks. Uh, two good questions. Um, I mean, some of my family are here. You could ask them. <laughs> But, you know, of course, you have to show them your work. I, or at least I did, especially those uh, pregnancy poems. Um, but, you know, I think she likes being the star of these poems. So um, that's a good thing. It would be bad if otherwise. But, you know, when so something like that happens, I think you have to, as a writer, write about it. Whether you, you know, you need to, you have to write it. It doesn't mean you have to publish about it. Um, and for me, especially that, I didn't want to write something... Um, obvious so I also was really conscious of that and, and for me it was sort of like a book I made that may never come to pass and it was almost the other way it almost speaks to your second question which is you're writing these poems and then you're like well maybe they have a life you know and so then they it's almost like everything is an outtake and then sometimes it becomes an intake you know sometimes it, it lives beyond its utterance um, and then uh, almost all of my books um, though they end up longer than some books, uh, I usually yank quite a bit. Um, and Jelly Roll was the first one I really was conscious of doing it. It's too long a story to tell now, but it's a good story. So sometime we'll have to catch up about it. But you know, I in one night just sort of yanked 20 poems out of it. And there's only a few that are in the book, probably four or five that made it back. Um, but it's not like I want them in Jelly Roll, but they have this other life, you know. Um, so uh, I really love the lives of the poem. And sometimes, you know, having especially been an editor, I see, like in Lucille Clifton's work, um, she had a whole um, packet of poems that she said were um, poems uh, that really should be thrown away one day, maybe, and then she could cross that off and say, bad poems, you know? <laughs> and they're better than most people's poems. Um, so, uh, you know, to look through those and get a sense of what's it mean to have sort of one's history. There was a history that those poems told about Clifton that I wanted to preserve. And for me, the, the, while I wouldn't say any of them rise to that, I wanted to have that kind of feel too. Yes, over here. Uh, my name is Durrell. Uh, thank you for speaking Hi. today. Thanks. Um, my question is, is there a reason why you ordered the poems, I think even the second book, the way you did with, I think your father, coming at the end and then the birth of your child in the middle? Um, yes, uh, Book of Hours. Uh, that was my, yeah, the second book I read today. It's my eighth or ninth book, I think. But anyway, the, um, the point of that, I think, was A, that's how it happened. You know, he died, and then uh, a year or two later, my son was born. So I, I really wanted to preserve that feeling, but I also wanted that kind of um, sense of, I guess life in general. You know, it is uh, death and birth, and sometimes it's birth before death, sometimes it's death and then this afterlife. And then I wanted this kind of um, what came after that, you know? Uh, so I really want to preserve that, what it felt like, I guess. And for me, in those poems, too, I really want to capture, find all the metaphor within the experience. So that's why I like the dogs. I, I didn't want to make things up exactly. Um, Nothing wrong with that. It just was for my, my project for that book was to really try to find metaphor within that experience, whether it was the dogs or being on the plane or what have you, and within that, um, find meaning uh, in what can seem real senseless. So that's, I think, why I tried to do that and combine those. Thank you. Hey, how are you? My name is Jesse. Um, on the subject of titles, I think about Emily Dickinson. You know, she loved titles. She did not have any titles. <laughs> anyway. You were talking about the value of time and place, and you mentioned that just a few minutes ago. And, and actually, before I, before I mentioned that, I thought about Borges' book Atlas. Okay. If you know about this, it's a strange travel journey that he did toward the end of his life. So his okay. mortality is as much part of the story as anything. Sure. And the mortality of the places that he's visiting around okay. the world. Okay. Anyway, the art of time and place. How would you describe the art of time and place for you in your work? Wow, that's a big question. 
time and place. Um, I mean, I think it's a really good, good thing. I mean, place is very important to me ever since my first book, uh, which was called Most Way Home, which was very much about Louisiana, a place where I never lived, but also where so much of my life was, if you know what I mean. So uh, we were there all the time, in the winter, in the summer, you know, it was just, and whenever my parents said, oh, well, I'm gonna go home, they meant Louisiana, and that's what I thought of. Um, but we moved around a lot. So um, place became this important place, but also uh, was always kind of at a distance. That also seemed to me um, part of the African-American experience, uh, exile, uh, travel, migration, all these things fit so well with that that it helped me understand. I mean, you wouldn't have the blues without that, right? Without that freedom, um, but also that uh, troubled departure. So for me, that uh, tension is always there in time and in place. Um, and the blues very much speak to that. I can't go far away from them. Um, and I had the good fortune to write a poem for the um, uh, migration series show by Jacob Lawrence that's in uh, New York right now. It's coming to DC actually. Uh, I don't know if it's this fall or you know winter, but you need to see it. It's an amazing show to see all in one place because they're divided between two museums, the migration series. And that series I think captures that feeling. Uh, you know, he was someone who had to you know sort of research and talk. It's as literary as it is um, anything else. All that's to say that that suite of paintings helped me see the way that a poem can function the same way, can capture time and place, can through sequence give you a sense of not just a point of view, but a wide point of view, a sort, of, sort of Whitman-esque point of view, but we might call it Lawrence-esque, thinking of Jacob Lawrence. One last question. You put together a number of anthologies, and your yes. jazz poems is one of my very favorites. Oh, thank um, you. I, I wonder if you could speak to the different sorts of pleasures and satisfactions that come from, from drawing uh, from lots of different people's works and, and bringing them to life. Sure, that's a great question. I mean, it, I think it's the pleasure that also is found in creating. You know, one um, is trying to, I hope, draw connections between these things, often disparate. Um, a good example for me was after having written many of the poems that are in this book, though I hadn't published this book yet, Book of Hours, I um, edited a book called The Art of Losing, a book of uh, grief poems. Um, and that was really important to me. It was almost like um, discovering what I thought after I thought it. You know, I had already written these poems and read a lot of the poems that became Art of Losing, but I hadn't put them all together. And to put them together and make this what I hope is an artful order, an arc, to think about grief um, through someone else's work was really powerful for me. And it's always moving to me when people come up and say, oh, that book helped me um, think about grief in a different way. Um, but there's also a kind of, um, it helps to do that. But also when you return to what your own work, I think it really you know, lets you be both generous to your own work and then also kind of ruthless, which that's a tough line to draw uh, or walk, but that's what you have to do, I think, as a writer is, is, especially when you're writing, you have to be you know, your best friend. You can't be talking trash about your own work, um, but it's hard to get that editor off your shoulder. You know? And uh, I think it's Richard Hugo who says, you know, when you're writing in your room, look around, look behind you. There's no one else there. You know, don't let those other voices in when you're composing. But then later, you have to go back I wouldn't say with a red pen, but with a green pen or a blue pen. And, and you have to be you know, serious about that returning angel, it's called the avenging angel of the editor. Um, and I, I think that, you know, um, yeah, my wife's laughing because she's an editor. Um, so, but um, editors are the best things in the world. And I happen to have a great one both at home, but also um, when, uh, with my books, I've been really fortunate. And so I respect the editing as, as a craft, you know, and it's one that we're, I think, solely, sorely missing sometimes. You know, um, papers or journals will say, oh, we don't need copy editing. Um, and then next thing you know, uh, the errors are very bad. Um, all that's to say, I'm going far from your question, 
only to say that I love that process of editing, and it really returns to me something that also writing does. Um, and I, I think the process is a good one. I hope more people do it. And, and really, even if it's your own personal anthology, it really helps to think about how do I put these things together? How, do, uh, how does other people's work speak to me and through me? Thanks so much. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.